Ryan Gass here at PTPGun.com and today we're going to go over basic handgun. The point of this video is so you can know how to more effectively and safely use your handgun. With that, we're going to start by going over the five firearm safety rules. The first rule again is treat every firearm as if it were loaded. Do not treat a firearm as anything other than it being loaded. Right? It doesn't matter what you think or what you know. It doesn't matter if you're 100% confident. You checked and your, your buddy double checked and your grandma checked for you. That gun's unloaded. It doesn't matter. Still treat it as if it were loaded at all points in time because mistakes happen. And we see far too often where somebody is crying their eyes out to a news camera after a tragic incident with a firearm and they're saying, oh my God, I thought it was unloaded. The gun was unloaded. I'm not sure how this happened. The gun just went off by itself. That's not true. Right? Obviously, if the gun went off and it struck and, and killed somebody or hurt somebody or anything, uh, obviously it wasn't unloaded. And obviously the gun didn't just go off by itself. Guns don't just go off by themselves. It takes a human being, whether maliciously or ignorantly or carelessly, to use a firearm in that way and that happens. It doesn't just go off. Make sure that when you are handling a firearm, you, you are always treating it as if it were loaded. It doesn't matter if it's a rifle, a pistol, or a shotgun. It doesn't matter your experience or your background. It doesn't matter if you're a firearms instructor, if you are a hunter, if you've been around guns all your life. None of that matters. Some of the most unsafe people I've ever met in my entire life are those who have a background with firearms. They've been hunting all their lives. They were a cop, or they are a cop, or they're military, or they're a firearms instructor even. It does not matter your experience level because firearms mistakes and mishaps happen to all peoples of all different backgrounds, experience levels, races, religions, genders, political affiliations. It doesn't matter. Treat every firearm as if it were loaded every single time. All right, and that gets us into our next rule, which says never point a firearm at anything you do not intend to shoot. If you don't intend to shoot me, why would you point a firearm at me? Right? If, you, if it, you or anybody else were to point a firearm at me, I'm expecting that my life's in danger. All right? Whether it's because you are ignorantly and carelessly pointing a firearm at me, or you are maliciously intending to do myself harm. Uh, never, ever point a firearm at anything or anybody that you do not intend to shoot. Now to the third rule, which is keep your finger straight and off the trigger until you're ready to fire. If your finger is on the trigger, it's either applying pressure to that trigger or it's relieving pressure from that trigger. It's not on that trigger and waiting for the opportunity to have to fire. Um, that's how mistakes happen because if your finger's on that trigger and you're not quite ready to fire and somebody spooks you, you cough, you sneeze, you, you drop something or not, a lot of times people tense up. Right, if you tense up on that trigger, that gun will go off. It's happened many times before. You're nobody special. It could happen to you too. Make sure that your finger is not on that trigger until you're ready to fire. Until you're ready to fire, it is on the frame. Not just outside the trigger guard and touching the trigger guard, but it's outside the trigger guard, off the trigger, and on that frame until you're ready to fire. And let's say you are ready to fire and you do fire one, two, three rounds. Once you decide that you are done and you no longer need to fire, at least at that moment, take your finger back off that trigger and on that frame until you might be needing to fire it again. If the, 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 the situation shows that you need to do that again, take your finger off the frame, put it back on that trigger, and go to work. Now rule four is keep your firearm on safe until you tend to fire. Not all firearms have safeties, especially handguns. Uh, most notably, uh, Glocks. I have my Glock 17 here. I'll go ahead and double check, unloaded, all right, for this video. All right, chamber's clear, new magazine inserted now. Uh, there are no mechanical safeties built into a Glock, all right? As of, at least not, as of yet, uh, they don't make firearm, they don't make handguns. Glock does not with uh, safeties. So if I this gun is loaded and I pull that trigger, it'll go off. There's no uh, buttons or levers that I can disengage this firearm from operating, and that doesn't make this firearm any more or less safe. Firearms with safeties are no more or less safe than ones with out safeties. Uh, an example, you know, I have a Beretta Neos. It's a 22 caliber semi-automatic handgun and it has a mechanical safety, but the safety broke. The safety broke years ago. Um, how I come to realize and, and figure out that it was broke is we were doing a handgun buffet and we had students that were shooting different firearms and I had one and I was watching the, the, the shooter for safety purposes and the shooter had loaded the magazine, loaded the magazine to the gun, racked it and goes to fire and I noticed that the safety is on. All right, and I know that it's not going to fire, or at least I think so. And um, 
She's pointing Sadie down range. She points at her target. Sadie is on. And my plan was, okay, she's going to pull the trigger. It won't go off. And then I'll allow the shooter to, you know, evaluate what happened. And if they need it, I could say, hey, you know, your safety's on. Go ahead and turn your safety off and then try again. But as I'm watching, I, I, to my surprise, the uh, she pulls the trigger, the gun goes off. And that wasn't unsafe, per se. Uh, if she was pointing in a safe direction, everything was fine. Uh, she had no idea that there was anything amiss. Uh, but I was like, mm. and uh, I, I let her do it again because I wanted to say maybe maybe I missed watch that maybe maybe I, I'm off and again safety's on she's pointed safe direction everything's done safely just the safety does not work and uh, she fires again and again and I stop her I take the firearm from her I keep it pointed safe direction and I try for myself I turn the safety off and on off and on a couple times and I make sure it's off. And I fire one, two, three rounds. I turn it on, one, two, three rounds. It doesn't matter with that firearm, whether the safety is on or off, there's no trick to it, there's no special place, it goes off every single time. Um, but that firearm is no more or less safe with that safety than my Glock. All right? uh, that's why regardless if your firearm has a safety or not, do not rely on it. Don't let it change the way you operate that firearm. If that person were to say, Hey Ryan, and they would point that firearm at me, and if I were to be cool with that, you know, both us screwing up, um, that could have been catastrophic. Uh, that gun would go off, and that person had no idea what's going on. That's why at all points in time, regardless of who you are, what gun you're using, whether it's your gun or my gun, or whoever's gun, it doesn't matter. If you have a safety, great, all right, use it, but do not rely on it. I don't want to take away from those who prefer to have guns of safeties. I personally, with my handguns, I personally don't prefer that. I don't want to have a safety on my firearm. Uh, I handle my firearms the same way every single time regardless, and it's one less thing that I have to remember to turn off and disengage in order to be able to use that firearm under stress. Uh, but if you want to use a firearm with a safety, you want to buy that, that's great. Again, great but do not treat it any differently. Do not get it in your mind that somehow that that firearm or you with that firearm is any more safer and that you can relax on any one of the rules uh, just because you have that there. And the last rule, which I think is very important, it's one of the more important rules, especially when you're talking about self-defense and concealed carry and even hunting, but know your target, know what's beyond your target and know what's between you and your target as well. Now let's break that down know your target. It sounds pretty basic and pretty simple, but why should you know what your target is? Oftentimes, people are shooting at a target that they think they know what it is, or they assume that you know, it, it's what it's gotta be, and um, it's not. All right? uh, the, you know, there's a dark figure walking through your house unexpectedly in the middle of the night. It's gotta be that you know, serial killer that's out to get you. You fire, you turn the lights back on, and it is your spouse coming back up from the kitchen to get a glass of water that, that night. Or it's your teenage daughter or son sneaking back in the house after a house party. Uh, or it's a spouse that com uh, unexpectedly came back early from a, a work shift uh, and you weren't expecting them. Uh, or it's say hunting, let's say you know, you sh you th you know, something that's not really um, you know, uh, unethical or immoral, but uh, maybe illegal, right? So let's say you, you shot at that, uh, that deer, you thought it was a doe, but it was a buck, and you don't have the proper tags or whatnot to be able to shoot a buck, and now you just broke the law. Um, it's very important that you know exactly what your target is, all right, again, and now what is beyond your target? Because just because you shoot at a target, and let's say it is a perfectly good target, let's say it's a legal and justified uh, target, but you miss, or the, the projectile, the round, it overpenetrates and it, it continues on. That happens. Where is that round ending up at? Right? If you shoot at somebody or something and it, it misses or it goes through and it hits some innocent bystander, that's going to be on you, right? both legally, criminally, civilly, uh, and uh, ethically too. I mean, regardless, let's just say, let's say you get off on all, you know, you don't get charged, anything like that. You still gotta live with whatever decisions you ever make, right? You have to think about it that way. You have to think about, you know, say you're out hunting and stuff. 
you have to think about, you know, if it was your kid on the other side of that deer, if it was your family on the other side of that person that is being a deadly threat to you, you have to be aware of, again, not only what your target is, but what lies beyond it. Now, it brings us to my last part, which is what is between your target. You want to make sure that the path that that, 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 that projectile is going to take to get to your target, that that path is free and clear, and it remains that during that time. Uh, I've got a deadly threat in front of me. I take my firearm out, and I have to discharge that firearm in order to defend myself against death or serious bodily harm. But as I'm doing so, some random innocent bystander walks between uh, in, the, in the line of fire, and I strike them. Again, it might be a tragic mistake per se, uh, but one, it was an avoidable one, and two, you're going to be held liable, and you should, right? Um, when we carry a firearm or we own a firearm or not, um, and we, it's for self-defense purposes, we do so with the uh, unspoken bond that we are doing this to defend ourselves. We want it to um, you know, prolong our life and, and ensure our safety without doing undue harm to any, uh, any other innocent persons. Right? Uh, and when you, um, when you relax on the fire safety rules, when you carelessly uh, just fire off rounds, uh, not being aware of your target, what's beyond it, what's between it, you point your firearm at things you shouldn't, you, um, you treat firearms as if they're uh, loaded and they're actually you know, not, uh, or vice versa, um, you break that sacred bond. You screw that up for not only yourself but other people. Every time a bad person with a gun or occasionally a good person with a gun makes a mistake, uh, all gun owners are held responsible for that. Even though that's not fair, that's not right, that's the truth of the matter. And so you have not only an obligation to yourself and those around you uh, physically, but also the, you know, the gun community as a whole to hold yourself to these standards, to follow these basic fire and safety rules, to hold yourself to a higher standard uh, because uh, these things matter. And I hope that um, you know, if you didn't already uh, know the fire safety rules or you didn't really value them, I'm hoping that I'm able to instill that in you even a little bit more um, because fire safety is very, very important to us being able to retain our rights, uh, which are being further infringed every single day. Americans enjoy a right that citizens of many other countries do not the right to keep and bear arms. That right is protected by the Second Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. It is the gunner's responsibility to store, operate, and maintain their firearms safely. It is the gunner's responsibility also to ensure that untrained or unauthorized individuals cannot gain access to his or her firearms. It's your responsibility to learn and obey all applicable laws pertaining to the purchase, use, and possession of a firearm in your locality. Guns are neither safe nor unsafe by themselves. I know this is astounding for some people to hear, but guns are not unsafe. It's the person behind them. Whether they're untrained, whether they are ignorant, whether they're careless, whether they're being malicious, it is the person that is dangerous with a firearm, not the firearm itself. Make sure that you are handling your firearms safely, ethically, morally, and you're following those firearm safety rules we went over. There's many reasons why people choose to own a pistol. Some of them might be just for recreation, taking the gun out to the range, shooting targets, blowing off a little steam, having some fun. For some, they actually do some competitive shooting, um, whether it's uh, fast pace and close up, whether it's long distance, slow pace, uh, precision rifle shooting. Uh, competition shooting has become a big part of the industry, and uh, it's got people from all walks of life coming and joining that, that side of things. For many, from the responses I get from the students in my classes, one of the biggest and most common reasons I see that people want to own pistols is for self-defense or home defense. Uh, a lot of people want to be able to defend themselves and their family, whether inside the home or even outside the home, and they'll go out and they'll get their carry permits. Uh, whatever your reason might be, that is always usually a very common thing I find amongst gun owners. For some, it's collecting. Whether you are collecting uh, new guns or old guns, uh, a certain type of uh, brand. Uh, guns have a lot of history and variations. There's a lot of value in guns and they retain their value pretty well. So uh, that could be another part of why you might want to own a pistol. And last but not least is exercising of your constitutional right. You have a right that is not given but is protected by the Second Amendment of the Constitution. It protects your right to keep and bear arms. And many have chosen to do that because they understand, they realize that in this world we live in, when seconds count, law enforcement are just minutes away. 
They have a thankless job and they try to do their best. But when you need help, you need it now, not minutes from now. You need to be able to be self-sufficient and you need to be able to defend yourself and your family in a situation where you may have your life threatened, where you are at fear of death or serious bodily harm. And that has been a big reason that I've, I've found from talking to students at all my classes over the years, the commonality in all of them is that they have part of the reason being their self-defense and protection of their family. Now let's talk about the different types of pistols. We have double action revolver, single action revolver, and semi-automatic pistols. Now let's go on to semi-automatic pistols. Semi-automatic pistols, the words matter. Semi-automatic. Sometimes I've seen where people, they'll drop the semi off and just say automatic pistol or automatic rifle, which is completely inaccurate. There's a difference between a semi-automatic pistol and an automatic pistol. First off, uh, we have a Glock 17 here. No magazine inserted, new round of the chamber, send the slide home. When you fire a semi-automatic pistol, right, you pull that trigger, right, you hold it to the rear, and one round. One round goes off. While it's doing that, the slider will reciprocate, it'll load the next round in, and now it's ready to fire again. And in order to fire again, you have to let go of the trigger and pull the trigger again. Every time you pull that trigger, one round comes out. Now, if this was an automatic pistol, which is one very similar to this, but it's not this, this is a Glock 17. A Glock 18 is a automatic pistol. And if you pull that trigger and you hold it to the rear, the gun will continue to fire until it either runs out of ammunition, it jams, or you let go of the trigger. Now, automatic pistols, or automatic rifles, automatic firearms in general, uh, they are very pricey and they are highly regulated. I've never seen anybody own an automatic pistol. Uh, not that people don't, people do, uh, but they're so few and far between, they're so expensive that it's not very common. Uh, oftentimes, if you see a news report where they talk about, oh, an automatic firearm was used in this crime, an automatic rifle were covered here, Nine times out of ten, it's not accurate, it's not true. Uh, what it is is, again, they're too lazy to say semi-automatic. Or, maybe it was truly, which is not very common, maybe it was truly an automatic firearm, but it was illegally modified to be that way. All right? uh, but uh, semi-automatic and automatic, very different. Automatic, you pull a trigger, you hold it, keeps on firing until it runs empty, you let go of the trigger, or it jams. Uh, semi-automatic, one pull, one round. Release and pull again, one round. Release and pull again, one round. Clearing a semi-automatic handgun. I want to show you how to unload this gun. So assume it's loaded, it's not. But let's assume it is. We say we have a round the chamber and a loaded magazine inserted. What we want to do is first hit the magazine release. Hit the magazine release and that magazine will come out. And I'll explain to you why we want to do that here in a moment. In that order. Uh, we want to, next, we want to pull the slide back to the rear. And if there's a round in the chamber, it'll fall out, right? Because the extractor is going to grab on that round and pull it out of the chamber and eject it, usually out and to the right. Uh, once we do that, we can lock our slide to the rear by pulling, the, when we pull the slide back, we can engage that slide catch on the side and that'll lock our slide to the rear so we can keep one hand on and view that there's no round in the chamber and no magazine inserted, right? Why I wanted you to take the magazine out first is this. If we get the round out of the chamber, all right, and then we take the magazine out, what do we just do? We took that round out, but then it loaded the next round in the magazine into the chamber, and then we took the magazine out. So we wanna make sure you always take out the source of ammunition first, take out that magazine first, and then clear the chamber. And sure, double check, make sure the firearm is clear. There is no magazine inserted, and there is no round in the chamber. If you do add or, that is extremely unsafe, and that's how mistakes and, and tragic incidents happen all too often. Similar to the double action only revolvers, the Glocks, like I have here, uh, they are double action only semi-automatics, where they only have one firing mode, and the trigger pull is consistent every single time. There's no single action and double action, there's no cocking of the hammer. It has a hammer, but it's hammerless. There, it's a hidden hammer uh, that's, that's contained within the slide. Uh, so it's the same trigger pull every single time.
Now, semi-automatic handguns, we have two main types of magazines. We have double-stacked magazines and single-stacked magazines. Uh, now, double-stacked are going to be wider magazines. They're going to make your firearms uh, grip wider, uh, but you'll be able to fit more rounds vertically in that space. Um, now, single-stack magazines, they are going to be, uh, they're going to tend to have a smaller uh, capacity, usually between uh, anywhere from six to about nine is most common, uh, but um, you're going to have a thinner profile. Uh, sometimes people lean more towards that sometimes because they want to be able to be more discreet when concealed carrying, although you can be discreet with a double-stack magazine firearm, such as the Glock 17. All right, so let's go ahead and break down the parts of a semi-automatic handgun. All right, we want to start off first with the frame. Every firearm has a frame. Uh, the frame is where everything connects back to. The frame is where the serial number is found on your commercially made firearm. You have the frame, you have the trigger guard, which protects the trigger, it guards the trigger. Uh, and obviously, subsequently inside there, you have the trigger. We have our magazine release. Again, magazine release, Drop, hit that button and it drops that magazine right out of that firearm. All right. We also have this slide lock. Uh, it locks a slide to the rear, which is automatically engaged by an empty magazine. It is not a slide release. It's not made to uh, be able to release the slide, although it can do that. It is made to catch that slide to the rear. We also have our front sight and subsequently we have our rear sight you have the muzzle end of the barrel. The, the rear end that where the round sits and it's fired from, that is the chamber end. The front end, the muzzle end, where the, the round exits the barrel, that is the muzzle end. Uh, the front end of any barrel is the muzzle of it. Doesn't matter if it's a rifle, pistol, or shotgun. So what we see here is a uh, inside view of a cartridge and how it's put together and all the different parts of that. Here, you're gonna see the projectile. The projectile is what actually exits the muzzle of the barrel and heads down and strikes your target. That is the projectile, or sometimes called the bullet. The overall cartridge is not the bullet. Uh, the bullet is the projectile itself. Uh, you can see where it's a uh, lead-filled, copper-jacketed uh, projectile. Now we see our powder. The powder is what actually is ignited by the primer and that creates combustion. That's what forces that round down the barrel. Now, as the round is loaded into the chamber end of that barrel, firing pin comes down, strikes the primer, makes a small spark, large explosion, and it forces that, you see that combustion following that projectile down the barrel as the round exits the muzzle. Now let's talk about the two root causes of firearm accidents. When a firearm accident happens, it's because of one or the other of these two causes. You have either ignorance or carelessness. So let's break those down. Ignorance. Who might have a firearm accident and it happened because they were ignorant? And what I mean by that, because sometimes people use that word uh, to uh, shame other people or this or that. It's just a descriptive word. If you don't know about something, you're ignorant of it, right? Uh, I don't know how to race uh, NASCARs and stuff. I'm ignorant of that. Uh, there are people in this world that are ignorant of how to safely and effectively use firearms. Uh, so who might that be? Who might have a firearm accident because of their ignorance? Our kids. It could be a kid. If you leave a firearm unsecured and you have a uh, juvenile who uh, doesn't know what they're doing, they haven't ever had been trained, uh, and they are curious and they get a hold of that firearm and something happens, it's because of their ignorance. Now, another side of that, again, is there's ignorance, but then there's carelessness. So even if you do know better, you can still have a firearm accident, and that would happen because you're careless. You know better, you know the rules, but you have actively chosen to ignore those rules. Uh, oftentimes we see this with people who are uh, even highly experienced. Again, like we talked about earlier, uh, some of the most unsafe people that I've ever met in my life were military people, were law enforcement uh, personnel, were people who have hunted all their life, been around guns all their life. Those type of people, oftentimes, you'll see where they'll get complacent. They, they're, uh, you know, oh, I've got it. You know, I've been around guns all my life, or oh, I've got it. Do you know what I do for a living? It doesn't matter if I'm a fire instructor myself. I can have a fire accident as well, and it oftentimes is going to happen when that person gets complacent, right? So you don't have time to get complacent. Carelessness or ignorance, those are the two root causes of firearm accidents. If you ever show me a firearm accident about something happened, I can pinpoint it to one or the other of those reasons. So, 
With that, let's go back over and review those firearm safety rules. Treat every firearm as if it were loaded. Never point a firearm at anything you do not intend to shoot. Keep your firearm on safe and intended to fire. Keep your finger straight off the trigger until you are ready to fire and know your target, know what lies beyond that target, and know what's between you and that target. So let's talk about selecting and purchasing your next handgun. Oftentimes, people will ask me at classes and out and about, Ryan, what's a good gun for me? What should, gun should I go out and buy? I'm wanting to buy my, my first handgun. Ryan, what do you own? And that's not a question I like to answer uh, because what I like, it fits me, my needs, my lifestyle, my bank account, and you need to find out what works best for you in your situation. Um, the first thing you're going to have to figure out, I even had a friend do that the other day. Um, you know, I, first thing I said to him was, what is the purpose of this firearm? Why are you buying this handgun? And he kind of looked at me and I was like, what are you going to use it for? And he was like, I don't, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I want to have something around the house for home defense and I might want it in the future. I'm not sure, but I think I might want to go ahead and, and carry it at the time, uh, an opportunity arises. And so I said, all right. You know, because that's going to help determine what you're going to uh, be looking for. Because the handgun, you're taking out just to go to the range, and uh, you want to just go out shooting with and have fun with, that could be a lot of things. That could be anything. But if it's going to be something that you want to have by the bed for home, to, for home defense, you might want to be a little more thoughtful in that. And additionally, if you're going to maybe have it by the bed, but also carry it, and you want to carry it concealed, and you want to be discreet with it, that's going to be another thing too, because if it's just a bedside gun, uh, you're not really caring how big or how small it is. Uh, you don't really care how bulky it might be. Uh, but if you're going to carry it on you and you're going to carry it concealed, now you got to take that into consideration. But let's say you're one that wants to open carry. Well, now you're not quite worried exactly about size. You might be worried about weight, but you're not worried about the overall profile because you're not trying to be discreet with it. If your purpose for that handgun is hunting, obviously that is going to be um, you know, a specific type of firearm, maybe a certain caliber, depending on what the local laws and regulations are. So you wanna make sure you look into that as well when you decide it's not only uh, what I need, but what meets legal requirements. Now, in Maryland, there's no legal requirements, and in many states, there's not a legal requirement for what the, the farm does to be able to use it for self-defense or carry, uh, but it, for hunting regulations, a lot of times that come into play, you know, caliber and things of that nature. Also, you got competitive shooting. If you're gonna buy a farm and you wanna go out and do competition shooting, uh, you're gonna be looking for a civic gun uh, for that. You know, oftentimes, competition guns tend to be very large, very heavy, very ugly, and very expensive. So you're gonna have to know that going into that about what you're gonna be buying it for. What is the purpose of that gun? And that's gonna help determine which gun is right for you with that situation. Also, things are gonna play into, you know, with a firearm and whether it's the right one for you is also user ability. Are you able to handle it? Is it too heavy for you? Are you able to pull the slide back? Are you able to uh, pull the trigger? Is it too heavy for you? Uh, can you pull the trigger but you can't pull it effectively? Um, you know, uh, your, your perception of the recoil is and how that's gonna affect you and your anticipation of the shot. All these things are gonna play into what and how you go about buying a firearm. It's not as simple as, that looks good, I like that, let's go ahead and buy it. Uh, if you got an extra money to just throw around and just buy a crap ton of guns and, and just have whatever, that's you know fine. But if you have a limited budget and you just want to buy one firearm that suits that particular need that you have, you need to put a little bit more thought into that and, and decide, is this truly the right firearm for me and what I'm using it for? Now let's talk about ammunition commonly found for handguns. You have rimless and you have rimmed. Rimless is often used for semi-automatic handguns. Rimmed is usually used for uh, revolvers. Now regardless of which ammunition you're using, they are very, very similar. Both have projectiles or bullets. That is the part of the cartridge that is going to be pressurized out of the barrel and it's gonna go down range and strike your target. You, behind that, you have the propellant. That is what is ignited by the primer. When it's ignited by the primer, it again, it creates back pressure and it's gonna force that projectile down the barrel towards your target. 
And now this is all held together by the casing, which is say for a semi-automatic handgun, that's the part that is ejected, extracted and ejected out of the gun, usually out into the right. Uh, these are very common, again, with all types of uh, ammunition, whether it's a revolver, semi-automatic, whether it's rimmed or rimless, you're gonna have these same components. Now the caliber, caliber is a measurement of the diameter of the bullet not of the casing, right? Because they can be obviously different, especially with a bottleneck cartridge. The name of the ammunition is typically in the either hundredths of an inch or millimeters. So there's two different types of projectiles. Main different types is hollow points and full metal jackets. What should you use and when should you use it? Because there is a difference. Full metal jackets are often used for just shooting on the range and plinking, and they tend to be cheaper as well. Hollow points are when you're using that for hunting or self-defense or concealed carry. Why use hollow points? Hollow points are designed to stop in the body of your target. So if you're, again, if you're shooting at a person, or you're shooting at an animal, they are designed to increase the chances that they're gonna stop, they're gonna uh, stop inside of that target. And how it does that is the, the nose, the point of that projectile is hollowed out. And because of that and the science behind it, as the, the projectile is traveling through it, it hits, it enters, and it's traveling through that target. The nose of that is expanding, and as it's expanding, it's creating a larger surface space and a lot more drag on that projectile, and it's allowing that bullet to slow down much faster than had it been a full metal jacket. Full metal jackets are often gonna be, if you fire at a target, oftentimes they're gonna be able to overpenetrate through and exit the other side and continue on. And again, that can be a safety problem, especially when you're talking about self-defense. If you shoot at that attacker and the round exits that attacker and continues on, that is a problem. So we wanna be able to mitigate that problem by using hollow points. So the never-ending question that's always debated, does size matter? Does length matter? And I'm here to tell you and show you that yes, the length of your barrel does matter. Now what we're looking at here is three different models of the Springfield XD. Uh, we have 9, we have 40, and we have 45. And with a 3 inch barrel, let's look at the feet per second that these are each producing. With 9 millimeter, again 3 inches, we are pro producing 1105 feet per second. 40 Smith & Wesson is producing 1071 feet per second. And 45 ACP is providing 911 feet per second. We notice as we go to a four inch barrel, the feet per second increases for all three calibers. With a four inch barrel, nine is providing 1173, 40 is providing 1136, and 45 is up to 1003 feet per second. We notice that, again, we add an extra inch and that length did help. Now with a five inch barrel, nine millimeter has broken up to now 1233, 40 is producing 1193, and 45 ACP is now up to 1047. So as we increase that barrel length, we are able to have a better feet per second, which is gonna help increase accuracy and range with our firearms. So how do you wanna store your ammunition? You bought your ammunition, you're not using it at the very moment, how do you store it? General rule of thumb, in a cool, dry place. Make sure that it doesn't have moisture exposed to it. Moisture can create corrosion and make the uh, ammunition over time either unsafe or at least unusable. So while you're firing your gun, it malfunctions. You pull the trigger and nothing happens. What do you do? How do you get that gun back in the fight? Every time. If that happens, pull the trigger and nothing happens, Tap the magazine, rack the slide back. As you're racking the slide back, it's going to eject that bad round out or it's going to load a round in and bang, try again. Because let's talk about why it happened. Right? Pull the trigger, nothing happens. Why did that happen? It happened because either there wasn't a round in the chamber in the first place or there's a bad round. So again, tap the magazine, make sure it's all the way in there so that when you rack the slide, it's going to put a new round in. If there's no round in the chamber, it's just going to put a new round in. If there is a bad round in the chamber, it's going to extract and eject that round out and then again load that next round out of your magazine. Always tap, rack, bang, try again. Now let's touch on again those five firearm safety rules. Treat every firearm as if it were loaded. 
Never point a fire at anything you're not intended to destroy. Keep your firearm on safe until you intend to fire. Keep your finger straight off the trigger until you're ready to fire. And know your target, what lies beyond that target, and what is between you and that target. So now let's get into the fun part and talk about actually using your firearm, actually shooting your firearm, and being effective with your firearm. We just talked about how to be safe with your firearm and how they are put together and how they work. Now let's talk about how to effectively use our firearms. And before we get into this, I want to touch on something, all right? Muscle memory. Let's explain it and let's talk about it, all right? Muscles, they don't have memory, all right? But if you do the right thing the same way, every time and you practice it repetitively multiple times you're going to be able to more naturally do that same action under pressure with stress when you need it and that's why it's important that you practice as often as you can and not only just practice but you practice the right way the effective way the safe way of doing it every single time if you have asked these things if you do not do them the right way every single time, you're going to get really good at doing it the wrong way, the unsafe way, the ineffective way. And you're going to create a bad habit that is so hard to break. It takes so much practice to break a bad habit. It's so much easier just to establish good habits right off the bat. So make sure that when you practice, you practice perfect. You don't just practice just to practice. This is not a check in the box. All right? This is not something you just, oh, I did that. No, you actually want to do it the right and safe and effective way every single time. Side alignment is when you are looking through, you're presenting your firearm to your target, and you're looking through that rear sight notch at your front sight post. As you're doing that, you want to make sure the top of each, the, the front sight post and that rear sight notch, the top is lined up evenly. Uh, sometimes your sights, they might actually have like dots incorporated into it. If you have dots, make sure those dots are all lined up. Additionally, there's going to be a little bit of a gap on the left and the right side of your front sight post. You want to make sure that you don't have too much on the right and only a little bit on the left. Make sure that you have equal light on both sides. So we have equal light and equal height. Now let's get into clear front sight. Clear front sight is re referencing the sight picture. So with your sight picture, you have your sights lined up, but your eye is not focused on your front and your rear sight. Your eye can only focus on one thing at a time, and when we're sight in on a target, we are looking at three things. We're looking at three things. We're looking at our target, our front sight post, and our rear sight notch, but our eye can only focus on one at a time, and the one that it should be focused on is that front sight. But let's talk about drawing your firearm and having to use it in a self-defense context. You're not going to have time to sit there and draw your firearm, fire, find a front sight post, equal height, equal light, clear front sight. But you are going to have time to establish your flash sight picture. Right? Flash sight picture occurs when the shooter is able to rapidly overlay the sights on the target without focusing on that front sight and without taking the time to gain perfect sight alignment. Now let's talk about trigger control. Pulling the trigger on a fire is not as simple as just pulling it to the rear and letting go. When you have a good high firm grip on your firearm, your finger is naturally gonna fall where it may, all right? There's no definitive spot. Oh, you want to have the tip of your finger, or oh, you wanna have that second notch of your finger. Uh, it's wherever your finger naturally falls because not everyone has the same uh, hand size. Uh, if, you, if you're using my firearm here and you have smaller hands than me and shorter fingers, well, guess what? Your finger is not gonna make contact naturally with that trigger where mine does. So it's wherever your finger naturally falls on that trigger when you have a proper grip, which we established earlier. Once you decide you need to fire, you take your finger, you put it on the trigger, and you're applying smooth, consistent rearward pressure on that trigger, now you're gonna come to a wall, and it's gonna feel a little bit extra pressure than you had before, and that means the shot is about to break. And you wanna practice pulling the trigger, you wanna practice dry firing, so that you better learn where that wall is. When you reach that wall, you pull a little bit farther, 
and that shot will break. Now, what's gonna happen is your semi-automatic handgun, it's going to cycle the slide, all right? And it's going to send that slide back forward and it's resetting that trigger while it does that. Now, when I release the trigger, you will hear and feel that click. That click means that I don't have to let go of the trigger any farther. Instead, I can now begin, if I, if I needed to fire another shot, I can now begin to uh, bring rearward pressure on the trigger, which will it'll quickly fire that next round. And again, it's going to cycle for you, all right? And the slide's going to come back forward, all right? And I can, again, apply that same pressure every single time. It is a great idea to be dry firing your farm because you're gonna better learn where that breaking point is. You're gonna understand what pressure you need to apply to that trigger and when it's gonna go off. You want to be able to uh, properly anticipate when that gun's going off. Now, what you don't wanna do is when you are applying pressure and you're anticipating that shot, you know it's about to go off because you've practiced time and time again. You don't want to, what, I, what I, you see sometimes is students will, at the last second, they will break and they are trying to bring the gun down because they know the gun's about to flip up and now it's going to account for shots lower on your target or hitting down below in front of that target. So you don't want to anticipate your shot in that way. But you do want to know your firing. You want to know when that trigger is going to break and you want to be able to control that properly every single time. So with our shooting stance, we want to make sure that we have a good, solid basis. We want to have our feet shoulder apart. If you wanted to, you can bring that down at foot back a little bit if you'd like. Uh, but you want to have, again, the feet shoulder apart. And when you have the gun out and presented, all right, you are, part of your stance is that you have your nose over your toes. If you were to spit, not like projectile spit, but you just drop some spit out of your mouth, it should go right in front of you and drop right in front of your toes. Uh, if, it's, if it doesn't, it hits you in your shirt or whatnot, it means you're leaning too far back. You shouldn't be leaning back at all. And you don't want to so much stand straight up. You want to lean a little bit into it. And I'll, tell you, I'll show you what I mean. All right. So notice how I am leaning into the gun a little bit, but nothing crazy. But I, I, want, I have a good solid base. I, I'm putting a little bit of weight behind that gun. Right, I'm, I'm a 200 pound man, and putting a little bit of weight behind that gun will help me uh, better control that, that recoil. Not that the recoil is anything to be worried about, not that it's gonna kick you back on your ass, uh, but you want to better control it so you can get more accurate follow-on shots. That's why you want to better control it. So again, feet short with the part, knees slightly bent, nose over toes, lean a little bit into it. Bring the gun up to you, bring the gun up to your eye line. Notice how when I, when I present my gun, I don't just push it out and then duck down behind it and whatnot. All right, what I'm doing, all right, again, I'm straight straight up. Knees, again, uh, knees not locked out. They're slightly bent, right? I'm leaning a little bit into it, right? And when I bring the gun up and out, I'm bringing the gun up to my eye line. My eye line is not adjust, right? Uh, I got my target out in front of me. There's an invisible line between my eye and the target. And with that, I want to bring my gun up to match that line. My, I want my sights, right, to match with my line of sight. So let's talk about loading your handgun, all right? We have our empty firearm, new magazine inserted, new round in the chamber, all right? With your initial load, the gun is empty and we're going to initially load our gun. So we're going to take out our first magazine. We're going to index the magazine, index finger along the front. All right, that allows it to better guide the magazine into the magazine well without even looking at it. I can maintain eye contact, situational awareness while I'm loading or reloading uh, because I'm indexing that magazine. So we're going to index the magazine, index, insert, tap, rack, and now you're ready to go. All right? Now notice when I put the magazine in, all right? When I put the magazine in, I index, all right, and I insert, and while you think it might be all the way in, it may very well, all right, when I insert, all right, I'm hitting it in, and what I do is I double check, I tap, rack, 
and then I'm ready to holster or use my firearm if so be. Now, tactical reload is when you've been firing your gun, right? You've been in a situation, whatever, you're firing your gun, your gun's not empty, and how you can tell is because a slide is forward. Uh, if it was locked to the rear, that tells you the gun is dry, and you can just double check and verify, no round in the chamber. Magazine's inserted, but there's no rounds left in the magazine. This would be dry, but when you have a slide forward, we can reasonably assume, while we could be wrong, the gun may have malfunctioned and not locked the slide at the rear, we can reasonably assume that the gun at least has one round left in the chamber. There could be more in the magazine, and there could be none in the gun, but we can reasonably assume there's at least one round in the gun. With a tactical reload, you're not messing with anything but the magazine itself. Now, when I'm ready to do the tactical reload, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take it out of that next magazine, I'm going to index it, and I have my middle finger curled around it. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open up my other fingers here and I'm going to take that and I'm going to grab hold and now I can go ahead and insert that next magazine, all right? Or another way to do it is when I take out that extra, ma extra magazine, all right, what I can do is I index in the magazine, I L-shape it, I grab a hold, I pull that out, rotate, insert, and I tap. Now, why am I not messing with the slide? Why am I not racking the slide at the rear? It's because, again, we can reasonably assume there's already a round in that chamber and we need not to do anything to that. All we're doing is swapping out magazines. One that only has, say, five or six rounds left and one that's completely full at 17. Now, dry reload. When you're shooting, 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 all of a sudden your slide locks to the rear, what that is telling you is that the gun is empty. And you can double check and verify that by bringing it back into your workspace Double checking to make sure that there's no round in the chamber. There is a magazine inserted, but there's no round in there. I can see the orange follower on top. All right? At this point in time, I can drop that magazine. I can hit that magazine release, drop that magazine around the ground because I don't need it anymore. It's dead weight. Take out that next magazine, and again, back to almost like an initial load. I'm inserting and indexing. Index, insert, tap, rack, and then I can either get back into the fight and or, again, reholster whatever I got to do. Uh, but now I have just done my dry reload. Again, the way to kind of remember that, be like, what are you, what are you saying dry? Dry, if, you're, if your gas tank is empty, it's dry. All right? If the lake bed is empty, it's dry. All right? So the gun is run dry, it's empty. Uh, so again, we take out that magazine, drop around the ground. We take our next magazine out and we can index, all right? insert, tap, rack, and then do whatever we find necessary at that point in time with our firearm. Whether it's hold on to it, discharge rounds down range, or if we need to, we can go ahead and holster. Now once more, let's go with these firearm safety rules. We want to really drill them into you so that you know and understand and live these rules every time that you handle firearms. First rule again, treat every firearm as if it were loaded. Never point your firearm at anything you do not intend to shoot. Keep your firearm on safe until you attend to fire. Keep your finger straight and off the trigger until you're ready to fire. And know your target, what lies beyond that target, and what's between you and that target. Let's go ahead and get into the disassembly, reassembly, and cleaning of a Glock 17. The first thing you want to do before taking apart any firearm and cleaning it is you want to make sure that it is unloaded. So we're going to double check, we're going to pick up the firearm, there is no magazine inserted, and there's no round in the chamber. All right, so we want to make sure we always verify that before you start disassembling, reassembly every firearm. Because oftentimes, including but not limited to in Glocks, uh, part of the disassembly process is to take and pull the trigger, uh, which obviously if you have a loaded gun, that's going to create a safety problem. So that's why it's always first things first. With that being done, we're going to go ahead, pull the slide back and let go. It's going to slam forward. From here, we're going to go ahead and pull the trigger. All right. Now, what we want to do next is we are going to, there's two different ways to do this. I'll show you a, a way that I find easiest for most people, is we're going to go ahead and touch the tabletop. We're going to lean the gun forward on its nose, and we're going to press down the slide. You'll notice how the slide will come back just a little bit, right? That's all we need, right? So maintaining that, just as it is, right, we're going to go ahead and we're going to grab hold of the takedown lever. It's on both sides, right here and right here, right? We're going to... Pull that piece down towards the bottom of the gun. Again, bottom of the gun, top of the gun. We're going to pull it down towards the bottom of the gun. Hold that there. While holding that there, we're going to release the pressure on the slide, and the slide will come right off. All right. From here, 
Uh, there are more parts in this frame, but this is as far as we are going to take apart the frame, right? So we're going to set that to the side. Now we want to go ahead and we're going to go ahead and set the slide upside down. We're going to take this spring and we're going to compress it and pull it up and out. Set that to the side as well. Now we can go ahead and turn the slide upside down. We can dump that, that uh, barrel out of the slide. Set that there as well. And then here we have left is the slide itself. Now there are more, just like the frame, there are more pieces within this slide, but this is as far as we're gonna take it apart for what we're doing here. From here, we have what we can refer to as a field strip Glock. This has been field strip now, and now we can do any type of cleaning and or maintenance that we might need to do to the farm. Today, we're just gonna get into cleaning, right? For this, we have our little placemat laid out. It's just an old use uh, shop towel. We have for cleaner and lubricant, we're using rim oil today. This is not the only thing out there. It's not the best thing in the world. It works for what we're doing, and uh, it's easily found in a lot of different uh, stores, both online and in person. Uh, also, we have just some uh, off-brand Q-tips. Any type of Q-tips will work. Uh, these are great for cleaning, which we'll show here in a moment. We also have a simple, cheap toothbrush from Walmart, nothing special. You can buy one, you know, cheap one new, or you can just you, you get your, uh, your old one out of the bathroom and buy yourself a new one. We also have another shop towel for wiping things off. And we have our boar snake, which we'll get in that a little bit more later. All right, so now we have our towel laid out. We're gonna go ahead and take these parts, spread them out a little better. We're gonna spray the parts inside and out and get that lubricant and that cleaner, uh, which we're using today's rim oil, all inside of there. We're going to spray down inside the barrel. Right. Spray it down just a little bit. Outside of the frame. Nothing crazy. The, uh, this cleaner is not going to hurt anything. There's no such things really as too much or really too little. Um, now every little bit of spray and lubricant that you put on there, you're going to want to get that off of there, especially if you're carrying the gun. This is my carry gun, so I'm going to have to spend more time making sure I get all the extra solvent off of that I put on there. Uh, but there's no such thing as too much. The, there's no type of technology or electronics built into this at all, so you're not going to hurt anything with this. Um, do not be worried at all while you're doing it. If you're too, I guess, rough with it, you use some abrasive metal brushes. Uh, it can take away from the finish a little bit. Uh, but uh, that's not really a, a, a usability problem though. It's just going to be a, a aesthetic problem. All right. So anywhere that this brush can touch inside and out, you're going to want to hit that. All right. Inside the magwell, everywhere. Anywhere it can touch, you can you hit it with that toothbrush. Inside the trigger guard. Again, the outside too. Same thing with every little part of this gun. Everything you can clean, everything you can hit with that brush, you're going to hit. Now, could I be taking a lot more time and being a lot more thorough with the cleaning of my gun? Absolutely, I could. Um, how much time and effort you put in to clean your gun and, and whatnot and how clean you make it is up to you. Whatever works for you. Um, I use these guns often. I get them dirty often. Uh, I clean them often. Uh, so I just give a general cleaning down to all my guns, um, especially with these Glocks. They're not very finicky. They're not uh, very needy. So, um, you know, what I'm doing and how I'm doing it, it's worked for me uh, very efficiently over the years. I mean, I'm not worried about it not working when I need it, which is the main thing. All right, you need to know that when you clean this firearm that it is going to do what you need to do in your time of need. So what we have here is the boar snake, right? Made by different brands and whatnot. Uh, but nonetheless, this, uh, this particular boar snake, it can be used on uh, 9mm, 380, 38 Special, 257 Magnum, and other similar calibers. Uh, but how it's used is you'll drop it in the barrel. It doesn't matter which end when it's taken apart, but I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, you drop it in the barrel, wrap it in your hand a little bit, and as you're gonna pull it through, these bristles I'm about to pull through, they're going to brush out the inside of the gun, all right? And after those have been through, now this is swabbing out all that broken up the dirt and debris and, and the cleaner as well, all right? And in one fail swoop, the inside of the barrel is perfectly clean, all right? Um, if you do it more than once, it's not gonna hurt anything, all right? Uh, if you do it more than twice though, you're just playing with it. Uh, 
Uh, we got the barrel cleaned. All right, we're going to uh, take my rag and I'll get inside this magazine well. All right, I'm going to work the outside of this frame. And all I'm doing right here is I'm getting off as much of the excess cleaner and dirt that I just cleaned. I'm getting as much of that off of there as possible. You're not going to be able to get it all, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but you want to get as much of it off as possible because, again, whatever is left on the firearm, you're going to... Uh, end up getting on your clothing or other places that is not necessary at all. All right, making a mess of it. And again, just rubbing the outside, get as much of that cleaner off as possible. All right. Now this is where the Q-tips are going to come into play. With these Q-tips, you can get in all of those hard to reach spots that the towel couldn't get. To simply not so much clean uh, and scrub, but to simply grab onto and get out any of that loose uh, debris and uh, cleaner as well. All right. Great thing about these, once you get a little bit dirty, you can just sit them to the side and get a fresh one. Now I'm gonna go ahead and get into the reassembly and we're gonna finish up a little bit more of the cleaning of the farm after we get it reassembled. Now for the reassembly, it's gonna be the same thing as disassembly but in reverse, all right? So we're gonna start with the slide upside down, drop the barrel in, put the spring and spring guide in, compress it down just a little bit, get it into its spot, all right? We're gonna go ahead and match up the inside of these notches right here on the bottom of the slide on the back. We're gonna match them up with the rail on the top of the frame. We're gonna insert that in, all right? And we're gonna pull all the way back. We're gonna keep it matched up. We're gonna pull it all the way back and let go. And you, that is the reassembly. You don't have to uh, engage any type of lock, locking mechanisms and that. It'll do that for you automatically. All right. Uh, now what I'm going to do is we just reassembled it, but we're going to do what's called functions check to make sure it is put back together properly. And that's simply pull the slide back, let go, pull the trigger. Pull the slide back, let go, pull the trigger. Pull the slide back, let go, and pull the trigger. Right. If it wasn't put back together properly, you wouldn't be able to pull that slide back. You wouldn't be able to pull the trigger back. It would feel weird. It would feel clunky. It would feel and sound that way. Uh, so if that is the case, disassemble it again, take it back apart, reassemble it, and, and take your time with it. Um, everyone makes mistakes. I've even made that mistake before. So no understand that if you don't have to put it back together properly, that's fine. Again, just disassemble it. Kapalk, kapalk, kapalk. So now that we've reassembled it, we're going to go ahead and do a function check to make sure that we did that properly. All right? Function check is simply pull back the slide, let go, now pull the trigger. Pull back the slide, let go, pull the trigger. Pull back the slide, let go, pull the trigger. And with that being done now, we can firmly and confidently say that the gun has been disassembled, reassembled properly. It's going to operate and function the way it needs to. Uh, if you do bet, put it back together improperly, uh, you'll be able to find that in that because it'll either sound or operate weird. You won't be able to pull it back to slide. You won't be able to pull the trigger. It won't reset the trigger. Some of those lines. So if that does happen during your function check, disassemble it again, put it back together properly, and take your time in doing so. A lot of times when you reassemble it improperly, you're rushing through it and uh, mistakes happen. So. Now that I have it back together, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take these Q-tips. I'm going to get in these harder reach spots that we were working at earlier and get some more of this cleaner out. All right. All around the trigger. All right. If it's glistening in the light, that means it's wet. That means it needs to be cleaned off. That right? means it's got leftover residue. All right. Just like when you uh, go to a car wash and you wash your car yourself and then you, um, you dry it off, with a towel or whatnot, and then five minutes later, say you go for a drive, and then you stop, well, guess what? What's coming out of those different crevices and cracks of that body of that car? More water, more soap, and whatnot, because you weren't able to get it all. It's all inside of there, so you gotta kind of help work it out of there. So how we're gonna do that? Again, we just cleaned it off a little bit, but I'm gonna work the slide some more, right? Take this towel again, go over it again while it's put back together, all right? Get the excess cleaner off of there.
And with that, we have disassembled, reassembled, and cleaned our Glock 17. Thank you all for your support of our veteran-owned and operated business. While this does conclude this portion of our training today, it shouldn't be the end of your training. Go to ptpgun.com backslash firearms training courses to find our full list of all of our upcoming in-person firearms training courses, as well as advanced firearms training courses. Also, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, ptpgun.com firearms training, to view more educational videos to help you not only learn to defend, but in the end, prevail. <laughs>